gotta keep chopping. Gotta keep on chopping. We wanted to see what it would be like to build this this canoe using the tools that have been in use for hundreds of years, all the way back when dugouts were just made with fire. I'm intrigued by the burning this afternoon, so I'm quite curious about how that's going to go too, whether it'll be easier or not. And assuming that the Indians went from burning and scraping to iron tools, it may or may not be easier. It may simply be adaptation of a technology that then takes its own place. It certainly happens in all cultures that once a new technology is introduced, it is learned and used even if it's not advantageous. So we tried starting a fire with a bow drill and it was a really humid day and our tinder was damp and we just couldn't get it to work. And so that was a skill that we determined needed a little more practice. But it was interesting, we got some smoke out of it and we couldn't quite get that coal, that little coal that we needed to get the tinder going. But then we started a fire down in the canoe and of course you only want to burn certain parts of the tree because you can burn out the sides and then all that work we did in chopping would have been wasted. So we took clay and we lined the sides so that the fire would just burn down and not out. Uh, we burned about four hours the first day and then we burned all afternoon the second day. Uh, and we kept adding to the clay if it got a little thin so that we wouldn't burn the wood underneath of it. And then we'd move the coals to one side and let it burn into another area and sprinkle that original area that had just been burning with water and that loosened up the char. And then we will first try the stone as that was able to clean that out. And we found that seashells scraped that char out better than anything. And we pretty much work at the same rate with the fire as we did with the metal tools. They worked equally as well. And the fire, of course, was a lot easier on us anyway. I was working as an archaeologist for the um, Historical and Museum Commission in Pennsylvania um, in the mid-1990s, and uh, we got a phone call from a guy up in the Poconos saying that he and a buddy had gone out fishing in the morning after a, a really big thunderstorm um, the night before and had found uh, what they believed was an Indian dugout canoe floating around in the pond. The, the vessel we found w uh, appeared to be um, contact period. That is, I, I think it was made with metal tools, so it would date in that part of the world, you know, from the 1600s or so. There are much older vessels that have been found in, in uh, particularly, um, I'm thinking of Phelps Lake in North Carolina, um, a few places in, in um, Florida and lower Mississippi, um, uh, southern Alabama, but in all cases when you find these things preserved and in some cases preserved for thousands of years it's because they're in a situation where they've got fairly acidic water um, the Pocono ponds for example are all that sort of dark tea stained uh, highly tannin water so you got pretty low pHs and also it's helpful if they're sunk down in something like a bog where you, you've also got low or no oxygen. Um, it, essentially, you know, the, what this comes down to is they're basically sort of pickled in, in acidic water and they, they last for a long time that way. Um, but it's rare. And, and I, I think I was able to document a total of 11 dugouts that have been recovered in the whole state of Pennsylvania um, over the years. <clears throat> but you got to remember that when these things were in use in, in, in pre-contact times uh, and you went to one of the large Native American towns along the Susquehanna River, there would have been hundreds of these things parked uh, you know, along the bank and ready for use. This was a, as, as common a feature uh, in Native American life certainly as the automobile is in ours. 
one of the most remarkable um, and I think most um, important features of, of um, the whole technology surrounding both the manufacture and use of dugout canoes is the fact that this is not a one-man show. You can't move the dugout log without plenty of hands. The work of, of hollowing the dugout goes much more quickly with plenty of hands. Launching the boat requires a lot of cooperation. I think that they are probably one of the best examples that I can think of of people looking to each other to accomplish a greater goal. It's a, it's a community project, so we realize how our ancestors or our, can't, our grandfathers, had, you know, how they must have communicated, how they got along good back in the old days. Watching the work go from the first awkward and clumsy attempts into actually making a hole in that log to the point that it has transitioned into a boat in our minds, I think. And I learned that you, well, I, I'm sure I knew this, but it's always good to reinforce that when people focus on a common project, they begin to form a community around that project and develop the ability to work together very well. And not only are we working on a canoe, you'd be talking about future projects, like in you know, whatever ceremony for us, for us being 